Hey guys, how you doing? So welcome to the third video for chapter 13. In this video, we're gonna look at genes, what they do and how they work, yeah, to understand inheritance, okay? Uh, let's jump into it, okay. Definition of a gene, a basic unit of heredity. It is made of DNA and it codes or acts as instructions, yeah, uh, to make molecules such as proteins. Now, proteins aren't the only thing that genes have instructions for, but it is one of the, one of the big things that we often observe and can see, okay? Uh, three aspects. It's got an aspect of heredity. It has to be able to be passed down from one generation to the next. Okay. It is made of DNA. Each d gene is a segment of DNA, and it codes for protein uh, production, which is a structural unit in the human body. Yeah. And so, if you think about a gene, if you think about DNA as being the blueprint or the book of life, then a gene really is just a page with containing the instructions or a recipe or of one particular type of protein, right? Um, and the gene, uh, reading the gene and interpreting the gene results in the production of a type of protein, whether it's a muscle protein or a protein fiber in the brain or in the eye, okay? Now, um, we already talked about DNA and RNA, yeah, but it's first, probably worth recognizing the difference between the two. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA just stands for ribonucleic acid. Now, they are similar, but they're not the same because DNA is the blueprint for genetic uh, information and it sits inside the nucleus. It never leaves the nucleus except for during mitosis when the nucleus dissolves, okay? Um, to get the instructions out, however, the DNA has to be first transcribed, in other words, photocopied into a single strand of RNA that is then carried outside. And it makes a lot of sense if you think about it. If you have these genetic instructions that are delicate, uh, are vital to the survival of the cell and eventually the organism. You don't want to be just passing it in and out of the nucleus just like that. So it sits inside the nucleus, in which case the, um, the RNA, which is produced inside the nucleolus within the nucleus, then uh, is the photocopied version of the DNA, which then goes out into the rest of the cell. And so RNA is pretty much identical to DNA, except instead of thymine, it uses uracil, which is read in the same way as thymine, and structurally is very similar to thymine, but um, contains a slightly different molecule. Yeah? So if you think about, here is the DNA, T-A-C-A-T, -A -A here is the RNA equivalent, A-U-G. U, A, G, right? And you can sort of see that instead of normally having a T that matches with the A, it's U matching the A instead, okay? Um, there are the molecules, yep, you can see there, thymine in DNA and uracil in RNA. RNA is single-stranded, DNA is double-stranded, and RNA acts as that template, that photocopy template of instructions that organisms then use to produce proteins, okay? Um, Almost all genes in humans are found in the nucleus, with the exception of mitochondrial DNA, yeah, which is the DNA found in mitochondria, um, which is sort of where they got the idea of uh, endosymbiosis theory back in chapter two. Okay, so genes can vary in size, but they average about 3,000 base pairs. Yeah, the um, TAGC base pairs, about 3,000 of them, will make up a single set of instructions for a unit of inheritance, yeah? For example, DMD, muscular dis uh, protein dystrophin, uh, contains about two million ones, and that's probably, I think, the longest one we've got. The muscle fibers that you have are made up of dystrophin, and they contain about two million base pairs. Uh, however, a histone gene uh, only contains 500 base pairs, and so that's the smallest one we have, right? And so there are about 21,000 or so uh, genes, or protein coding genes, that we have in the human genome, right? Um, many genes will code for a particular protein. Um, there are also genes that don't code for proteins, but they also serve other important regulatory functions. They maintain the function of the system and can act as some, some sort of messengers or genes that control other genes as well. And then there's also a third category of genes which we call junk DNA. Genes that at the moment have no observable function, but are still sitting in our DNA sequence, right? Um, now, protein coding genes, many of the genes um, will code for these proteins. Uh, ABO, uh, or blood type, is coded by a particular gene called the ABO gene, right? Um, so, you know, you have one version of this gene which codes for A type, B type, and O type, or any combination of, the, of, the, um, of them, right? Uh, there's also another gene called the BRCA1 gene, which is in, uh, responsible for control of DNA repairment. And uh, if this gene is stuffed up in any sort of way, it results in often cancer, right? And so you can sort of see there, uh, they play really important roles, these genes, in maintaining the function of the organism, okay? Um, now, 
the proteins that they make. Uh, to make a protein, um, you need a really long chain of what we call amino acids, which is one of the essential biological molecules, right? Um, these long chains are called polypeptide chains. And so if you think about it, an amino acid is like a piece of Lego in terms of the protein world, and by stacking heaps of them together, you create the main structure of that protein that you need, right? And so each of these, if this is a polypeptide chain here, you can see there that you know, each of these little circles can be considered as amino acid, and by joining them together in a certain arrangement, you make the protein fibers that you often see, right? And specifically here is sort of what they look like. Here's the structure of one amino acid, uh, right? Uh, chemically speaking, it contains a carbon central uh, atom uh, with four covalent bonds on either side, one with an amino group containing nitrogen, one with a carboxyl group, and then a side chain represented by the letter R because the side chain of each amino acid can be different from other amino acids. So we just use the letter R to represent that, right? Now, each amino acid is coded by a triplet, three base pairs, yeah? So in other words, remember a base is the A, T, C, and G. So if you have three of those letters stuck together, that codes for one amino acid. So A, A, A could code for one, A, T, G could code for another, G, A, C could code for another type of amino acids and so forth. So you can sort of see there, that's the kind of main structure that you've got there. Right. Here's a, a bit of a guide to the 20 common amino acids that we know. Right. There are over 500 in nature, but really only about uh, 20 of them are uh, coded by, the, by, uh, by humans. Right. Uh, nine of them are what we considered as being essential and cannot be produced by the human body or synthesized, and then the others can. Right. And so you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Right. And those are the essential ones. Right. Uh, just below each of them, you can sort of see in very, very small writing the actual base letters that code for this type. So, for example, alanine, the amino acid alanine, is coded by GCT, GCC, GCA, GCG, right? And so all those triplets will code for this one amino acid, right? And you can see there it's all different for each one. So every triplet combination will code for some sort of amino acid or some sort of instruction amongst the amino acids, right? Um, here's the table that talks about it. You can see there, majority of them uh, are represented by these letters. So there's the amino acid it creates, PHE, LEU, uh, which I think is leucine, um, ILE, MET, um, and then so forth and so forth. Here is the instructions for them from the RNA. You, can, you know it's RNA because it has a U instead of a T in it. So UUU and UUC will create PHE. UUA and UUG will create LEU. You can see there some of them will double over. Um, now there are a few separate ones that are quite special. For example, you'll notice here UAA does not code for amino acid. It codes for um, a stop. Yeah. In other words, when it reaches this particular code, the amino acid production stops there and it completes that amino acid and it stops it altogether. Right. Um, same with UAG and UGA. Now there is one for start, which is MET or MET. And that amino acid tells, or is the, always the, the kind of the first set or the first code to start producing that particular type of protein segment. So if you start with a segment U, A, U, G, that will start it going, and then if you add other letters onto it, the ribosome will then read it accordingly, right? Um, now, there are also non-coding genes. So only 2% of all genes actually code for protein production. The rest of them are non-coding, and they don't code for a particular protein, but they serve all these other parts as well. So for example, some genes are ribosomal RNA, which form parts of the ribosome itself. The ribosome, if you remember from chapter 2, is the organelle within the cell that produces the protein. Okay? Um, some of them are tRNA or transfer RNA, and they are also involved in the process, which we'll actually go over in a second. And then others have regulatory function. They enhance the level of expression of some genes while switching off the expression of other genes. Uh, some of them are involved in telomere shortening, which are these kind of repetitive ends of the chromosome, um, which are also part of the aging process. And I'll explain that later on as well. And then the last category, once again, the junk DNA that serve no observed functions. Okay? So um, if you look at a ribosome, this is how we can understand how you get the gene or the sequence of RNA, which is um, what the photocopy instructions for the protein to get to the protein. Okay? So if you think about it from this perspective, right? 
your, each cell contains lots and lots and lots of ribosomes. Each of these ribosomes uh, are structured in a way that allows the ribosome to create a little polypeptide chain, and that's what the ribosome is. They have protein factories, okay? Um, the nucleus will transcribe a piece of DNA into an RNA messenger, right, which is the photocopy. That RNA is called mRNA or messenger RNA. It then gets transferred to a ribosome and it runs into the ribosome like a bit of a conveyor belt. And what happens is the ribosome then reads it using these molecules called the TNA, tRNA molecule or transfer RNA molecule, which is this little kind of like funny little suction cup here. And inside the suction cup contains the ability to read three base pairs or one triplet, right? So on one end of the triplet, it can read the base pairs or triplet. On the other end, it will attach itself to an amino acid. It will find one that the cell provides and it will come together. So this one here has a yellow amino acid. It will come in, in, in. It will attach itself to the correct base pair and it will then release the amino acid to join together with the other sequences of amino acids. So what you get is by reading this particular conveyor belt, you can then determine the order of amino acids that form your chain, right? And that's what the protein is. Yeah, it is this chain of amino acids repeating one after the other. Uh, here's a bit of an animation to sort of show you how it works. You can see there, there's the mRNA shifting its way through the ribosome like a conveyor belt. There, these little funny cross things are the tRNA, and then what it does is it collects a type of amino acid, joins them together, and then it moves the chain along. The tRNA then disappears, right, and then finds another amino acid and repeats the process all over again. You can see there, on one end, contains the little codon that attaches itself and matching the RNA, yeah? So you can see there, A to U, U to A, G to C, right? And so that's how your protein is being made. And that's why DNA can be, you know, red, or the mRNA, sorry, can be red and then matching the amino acid, okay? Um, now, the second thing uh, is the telomeres. Um, now, this is a bit of a, a side thing, which is, I think, I think quite fascinating, is that uh, one of the things I've discovered recently is that as we grow older, uh, what happens is the end of our chromosomes begin to shrink, right? And so that's what we call telomere shortening, right? The telomeres are the end of these chromosomes, and they are basically repetition, the same sequence over and over and over and over and over again. And they act as a bit of buffers, because what happens is every time your body undergoes mitosis, um, the process is not perfect. And what happens is a bit of the cell, uh, during the cell division, a bit of the chromosome actually gets cut off every time. And so the cells actually, the chromosomes in your cells are actually growing shorter every time your cell divides. It's only a small amount, right? But every time it divides, it gets shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter until eventually you start losing actual segments of DNA that are important. And so what happens is um, these telomeres are these kind of buffer for that particular chromosome process. And scientists believe that that's what causes an organism to age, yeah? Um, that cell division process is not perfect every time and it gets worse and worse and worse. Eventually, uh, your body is no longer, or your cells uh, are no longer able to continuously divide, right? And so that's a very interesting perspective um, from that um, as well. Uh, now, if you remember back to our cloning um, so sort of chapter, I also talked about how cloned organisms tend to have generally shorter lifespan. And that's because when you take the DNA or the chromosomes of an existing organism and form the template for a new organism you're about to clone, what happens is you're taking a segment that's already been cut off. If you take an adult, uh, for example, you know, a chromosome from a, a sheep, right, that that telomere is already so short because that organism is already aged. You've put it into a new cell, and so what happens is your new organism starts off with that telomere length rather than a full length as it normally would if it was a newborn baby, right? And so that's the kind of um, reason as to why clones generally age and, and die earlier than the majority of animals born through natural means because you don't have this you know, fresh zygote with an, with an extra long telomere at the end. So some really fascinating stuff around that. Okay. Um, all right, in the last part of the chapter, I just want to talk about the Human Genome Project. Um, and it's a bit of a side thing, but it's also you know, really interesting to sort of understand some of the innovative things that scientists are really doing in the area of genetics. Okay? Um, and so um, 
you know, a while ago, in around about the 1990s, they really set out to map out the entire, all of the possible human genes uh, that we have. Now, to do that, you basically have to survey as many people as possible, um, and it was one of the world's largest biological project, and they declared it complete in about 2003. So they reckon, you know, for about, you know, the last maybe about 15 or so years um, that they we figured out, it, you know, all of the genes that represent the human species, right? Um, and so the... The benefits of doing this is that, you know, if you can identify all, all these things through the Genome Project, you can then identify the inherited disorders. If you know uh, a specific gene is linked to some diseases like breast cancer and things like that, um, you can figure out what is causing those um, disorders. Um, you can then treat them. Uh, you can also figure out prevention methods, so looking at genetic factors and how they affect um, human systems. Um, you can understand human biology and also looking at human evolution, right? And so that's a, a really fascinating um, aspect there. Um, cool. Now, the last part we're going to look at, um, genes and alleles. Um, we're going to look at this in more detail in the next chapter, but it is worth sort of flagging down with you guys to see that... Um, you know, when we talk about Mendel's and his peas, um, he identified two different traits, uh, dominant and recessiveness within these traits. Um, since we discovered the genes, we also figured out that there are variations of the same gene, right? And so what happens is if we receive one copy of this gene, for example, blood type gene from a mom and a different copy from a father, there needs to be some sort of order or some sort of method that the cell has to recognize which gene do I then code the instruction for and, and, and initiate those type of proteins, right? And so different genes have variations, right? And so an allele is a, a different variation of the same gene. Genes with two, uh, with more than two alleles are called, or are said to have multiple alleles, and each organism can only have two, right? Because you get one from mom and one from dad, right? And so everything from um, the color in capsicum to the, the coat color in cats to their eye color and things like that, um, there are variations of that same gene forming your alleles, right? Um, here are a few genes and some of the different variations they have, yeah? So that same segment of the DNA codes for ABO blood type. However, we now know that there are different alleles, yeah? You've got uh, this particular allele here called IA, which produces the antigen A, uh, which also determines A blood. Um, IB, which produces antigen B and then a lowercase i, which produces neither antigen, right? And both of these, you can see, are located on chromosome 9, right? Um, you've got a few others, CFTR, uh, which um, codes for cystic fibrosis. Um, sorry, it codes for the particular regulator that if it stuffs up, it ends up resulting in cystic fibrosis. Um, you've got a capital C for normal, and then you've got a lowercase c for abnormal. So you can see there, this one has two alleles of the same gene, right? Uh, same set of instructions except one codes for a normal secretion and one codes for a abnormal secretion which doesn't work, right? And we'll look at that in later chapters when we get the chance to, right? Um, here's a few more. Um, you can see that now you've got even more different variations. Some of them have up to four, so S, SI, SP, SC, right? Um, and, and so forth and so forth, okay? Um, 